Oh Lord, let your merciful ears be open again to our prayers and our petitions and that we may be pleasing and bring pleasure, delight to you. May we ask those things that are good and lawful, and holy and right through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 2 and 3 of Top Liddy's hymn. Should my tears for him 685, should my tears forever flow, should my zeal no languor know, languor, languor know, all for sin could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyelids close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on the throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. We turn and open up uh, this study by Coney, Coney Bear and Hausen which in my estimation is top shelf on the life epistles of St. Paul. I've read it a number of times over the years, but it's been a long time. And I remember the first tour through it, um, I was stunned because I felt like it's like you get in, you're, it's like you walk along the path with Paul. You feel like you're approaching Ephesus or you feel like you're walking from Pozzuoli up Naples into Rome. He, these two Anglican writers take you right into the period in an imaginative way. And it's my understanding, we'll see, they actually went themselves and did the walking around. I think, I, I, if memory serves me right. And so they had the sense of the literal lay of the land, the geography. What did Paul see when he pulled into the port in Ephesus? I should say Miletus or Caesarea or when he left Sincrea, the port just a little up the way from Athens. What did he see when he landed in Malta and came up through the eastern side of Sicily and through the Straits of the Regium area, Straits of Messina. You feel like you're walking and living with Paul and his journeys. And then on the epistles, they do some kind of interesting things. They kind of like gloss the epistles to give their, their sense of Paul. You really get a good sense of Paul. Uh, Reverend W.J. Con Coney Bear was a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, Anglican man. And then the Dean of Chester, very Reverend J.S. Howson, a doctor of divinity. The edition I have is a 1976 edition, so I date myself if there's later editions. But so we got a, how many chapters here? It's going to be a long. <laughs> We're going to be traveling with Paul around 38 chapters. And it looks as here, yeah, we get on the Apian Way, travel up the road, you know, to Rome. Talks about ships and navigation. <clears throat> Paul at Corinth, Troas, Antioch. Wow. This is going to be fun, God willing, God enabling. This was a man in God's providence, sovereignly elected before the foundation of the world to be a messenger and an agent for Jesus Christ, a man with a steel backbone, suffered a lot, as he tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, abundant sufferings, but irrepressible. Let's turn to the introduction on page, you know, those good little uh, page 11 not the Arabic numerals, but the whatever, X, Iota. The purpose of this work is to give a living picture of St. Paul himself and the circumstances by which he was surrounded, and he does that. Again, this could be the number one book 
in the library in Paul. And I say that aware of F.F. Bruce and some other Ritter boss and other scholars on Paul. And I'm not sure when this was written. I'd need to check it out. I think it's a 19th century production, but I could be wrong. The biography of the apostle must be compiled from two sources. First, his own letters. And secondly, the narrative of the Acts of the Apostles. The latter, the Acts, after a slight sketch of his early history, supplies us with further de details in the middle of it. And this kind of applies over to uh, our friend Werner, Werner Kummel, and his mishandling of the canon. And we date Luke and Acts. Early 60s, maybe late 50s, Dr. Peter Hertz and I are kicking that around. Do you really think? Because Paul is, I think Paul went to Spain. That's extra canonical evidence that suggests and indicates that. And we know in Romans he wanted to go to Spain. And he ends up, at uh, the end of Acts, kind of a happy camper with two years under house arrest, but he's preaching and teaching and happy as can be. And then we get what I think is a release, and he does more work, which Acts does not cover, and he does work, and we get the pastorals later than Luke Acts. And why would Luke cut off, you know, with the happy imprisonment of Paul <laughs> those two years? Because I think the governing principle was not about Paul or Luke but rather the sovereignty of God, getting the gospel from the center of Israelite's empire, J Jerusalem, or I should say kingdom, is Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, the mother, the birth place of Christianity where it began to explode to the center of the known Roman, uh, center of the civilized world at that time, the Roman empire. Now, you could have told a whole lot more stories about Peter the other apostles he was a researcher and he selected what was important to him so even though paul's a traveling companion revered authoritative apostle it's very i'm comfortable saying he didn't see a need to include further historical work i could be wrong in that but this might it's my, it's my working theory for 30 years but we'll see we'll test it his epistles afford much subsidiary information concerning his missionary labors during the same period. The light concentrated on this portion of his course makes darker by contrast the obscurity which rests upon the remainder. For we are left to gain what knowledge we can of his later years from scattered hints in a few short letters of his own and from a single sentence of his disciple. Clement, and I believe that's the Clement. It's funny to read some literature in another study where sources of Catholic dogma by Cardinal Zet Denzinger, and they call him Pope Clement. Now that is a piece of historical revisionism on a grand scale, reading in 10th, 11th century concepts of omnipotence and regality and all that back into Pope Clement I, Paul's traveling companion. You think Clement called himself Pope Clement? Only in Rome do you get that kind of revisionism. Quirky, skewed, misleading. Clement in his letter makes it clear that he distinguished his own authority from Paul. Paul was the senior because he was an apostle. Clement who lived on beyond Paul writes his letter to the Corinthians. Anyways, enough in there, I'm digressing a little. The disciple Clement, <coughs> disciple Clement of Paul. And he had other, others helpers too, as we read in Romans 16. But in order to present anything like a living picture of St. Paul's career, much more is necessary 
than a mere transcript of the scriptural narrative, even where it's at the fullest. Every step of his course brings us into contact with some new phase of ancient life, unfamiliar to our modern experience, and upon which we must throw light from other sources if we wish to form a distinct image in the mind. And that's what these guys are geniuses at. You get through Coiny Baron House. I can't commend it high enough. It's, it's a top drawer, top shelf book. For example, to comprehend the influences under which he grew to manhood, we must realize the position of a Jewish family in Tarsus. We must understand the kind of education which the son of such a family boy would receive in his Hebrew home or in the schools of his native city and in his riper youth at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem. We must be acquainted with the profession of for faith he was prepared for by his training and appreciate the station and duties as an expounder of the law. And this is important for canonical studies. The view Paul had of the Old Testament, we know. <laughs> Who was it, the ancient father? It was Origen. I forget, one of them. So what's Paul do? He's always quoting scripture. What's the importance of that? Well, one of the importances the father said was to show ministers that whatever they do or say, they must be armed and maintain themselves. The scripture was a soul scripture quote, pure and simple. I don't know if it was origin. I'll go back and check the records. I do so much reading all day long, but the importance of Paul's training as an expounder and expositor as a rabbi, as of the school of the Pharisees, the strictest of the strict. We know what the canon was. It's 39 books that we got now. We look at Josephus, he's a little bit later in the first century, but they had the Apocrypha, but they distinguished that between the, in the 39 books. That's another subject that we're still exploring. And that we may fully be qualified to do this, we should have a clear view of the state of the Roman Empire at the time, and especially of its system in the provinces. We should also understand the political position of the Jews, of the dispersion. We should, so to speak, we should be, so to speak, hearers in their synagogues, absolutely. In their transport machine, fly back the first century synagogue life should be students of their rabbinical theology Alfred Edersheim would like would shine and glisten and glow with that comment he would agree and he brought that to bear in his works you may want to try to read all of Edersheim or reread him there may be one or two more volumes out here I got looking around. And in manner, we, as we follow the pop apostle in the different stages of his varied and adventurous career, we must strive continually to bring out their true brightness, the half-effaced forms and coloring of the scene in which he acts. And while he becomes all things to all men, that he might by all means save some, we must form to ourselves a living likeness of the things and of the men among whom he moved, if we would rightly estimate his work. Thus we must study Christianity rising in the midst of Judaism. We must realize the position of the early churches with their mixed society to which Jews, proselytes, and heathens had each contributed a characteristic element. We must qualify ourselves to be umpires, if we may so speak, in their violent internal decisions, one thinks of Corinth. We must listen to the strife of their schismatic parties when they say, I am of Paul, I am of another, I am of Cephas. 
We must study the true character of the, those early heresies, which even denied the resurrection. Those Corinth, Corinthians again. And advocated impurity and lawlessness, claiming the right to sin that grace might abound. They were, we read of that in Romans. They were accusing Paul of that, of lawlessness and antinomianism. antinomianism. And he says, uh, we're slanderously liable in this respect, and their condemnation is just. Defiling the mind and conscience of their followers, thinking of the, the Ephesians, who were once alienated in their minds and affections. Of their followers, making them abominable and disobedient to every good work, reprobate. Titus 1.16, lazy gluttons, as one of the poets said, and this statement is true. <laughs> we must trace the extent to which Greek philosophy, Judaizing formalism, and let's we'll stop on formalism for a minute. We're prayer book people. Not giving up the prayer book for the form, guys. Presbyterian Baptists don't even know what it is. We had our fights in Anglicanism, etc. Not giving it up. But we're not giving up spontaneous prayer either. Well, both. Not either or. Freedom in prayer? Yeah. Get up from the desk and go for a walk. Sit in your back porch. Commune with God. Go to Walmart. One eye in heaven, one eye on earth. Offer spontaneous prayers. But don't come along and say, i got to throw it out because only spontaneous prayers are allowed. It's all kinds of written prayers in the Bible. Written. Lord's Prayer is one of several. And then Eastern superstition blended their tainting influence with pure fermentation of that new leaven, which was at last to leaven the whole mass of civilized society. Again, to understand St. Paul's personal history as a missionary to the heathen, we must know the state of different populations which he visited. The library in Ephesus was well known. What's, he was lectured in a school of Tyrannus. What about the schools and the intellectual climate? What about Athens? What Were there any further discussions after his sermon on Mars Hill? The character of the Greek and Roman civilization of the epoch. Quanty Barenhausen is going to go through this. 900 pages. This is just introduction. This is where his mind is going. He's going to walk us through. The points of intersection between political history of the world and the scriptural narrative the social organization and gradation of ranks for which he enjoins respect, the position of women to which he specifically refers in many letters, the relations between parents and children, slaves and masters, which he not vainly sought to imbue with the loving spirit of the gospel, the quality and influence under the empire of the Greek and Roman religions. It's at Ephesus, we, we see the uh, tradesmen were upset because it's impacting the idle market, or the market, I should say, for their little regalia and whatever it went with. The accoutrements of the Temple of Diana. I don't like that money issue. The public amusements of the people, whence draw topics of warning and illustration. The operation of the Roman law, under which he was frequently arraigned. The courts in which he was tried. The magistrates by whose sentence he suffered. The legionary soldiers who served as his guards. The roads by which he traveled whether through the mountains of Lycaonia or marshes of Latium, the course of commerce by which his journeys were so often regulated, and the character of the imperfect navigation by which his life 
was so many times endangered. We read in 2 Corinthians 11 that he had suffered a few shipwrecks. I'd have to go back and check, but at least one shipwreck before the shipwreck of Acts 27. I think he says it in 2 Corinthians 11 that he was at open sea for a day and a night. Yet he pressed on. And he get, they'll get into navigation stuff later. Well, thus trying to live in the life of the bygone age, to call up the figure of the past from its tomb, duly robed in all the former raiment, every help is welcome, which enable us to fill up the dim outline and any part of its reality. <clears throat> may be partaking, participating in sort of the Victorian romanticization of history. It stirred and stimulated the love of old things. I don't know. And that may that's an interesting term, romantic romantic period. Especially we delight to look upon the only one of the manifold features of that past existence which is still living. We remember with pleasure that the earth, the sea, and the sky still combine for us the same landscapes which passed before the eyes of the wayfaring apostle. The plain of Cilicia, the snowy distances of Taurus. See what him, he gets out his artist's brush, starts painting in the, the cold and rapid stream of the Snidus, the broad Orontes in Antioch, under the shadow of its steep banks with their thickets of jasmine and oleander, the hills which stand about Jerusalem, the arched fountains cold in the ravines below, those flowery brooks beneath that wash their hallowed feet, the capes and islands of the Grecian Sea. <laughs> There's a lot of islands in the Aegean. The craggy summit of Areopagus. The landlocked harbor of Syracuse. We got into Syracuse a number of times. In Sicily. And they landed in Syracuse, as memory serves, when they were headed up to front with the first trip to Rome. We would we would pull into port in Augusta Bay, just a little I don't know if it was south of that or just forget now. The towering cone of Mount Etna <laughs> Sicily. The voluptuous loveliness of the Camp Campanian shore that's coming up to Naples. All these remain to us the perishable handiwork of God's nature. We can still look upon the same trees and flowers which he saw clothing the mountains, giving color to the plains or reflected in the rivers. We may think of him along the palms of Syria, the cedars of Lebanon, the olives of Attica, <laughs> olive trees all over Greece, Italy too. The green Isthmian, Isthmian pines of Corinth, whose leaves wore those fading gar garlands, which he contrasts with the incorruptible crown, the prize for which he fought. Nay, we can even still look further upon some of the works of man which filled him with wonder or moved him to indignation. The temples made with hands, because he saw the Parthenon, right? Which rose before him, the very apotheosis of idolatry. On the Acropolis, still stand in almost undiminished majesty and beauty. The mole on which he landed in Pozzuoli still stretches its ruins into the blue waters of the day. It's a nice little spot down there. Pozzuoli is like a suburb of Naples, to just a touch to the north. Lovely, northern side of the harbor there. Lovely little spot, still hustling, bustling. It's 
It's got a small coliseum there too, right near where he landed. They've marked it all out, and I see no reason to doubt that. Still stretches the remains of the Bayan villas whose marble porticos he then beheld glittering at the sunset. His first specimen of Italian luxury still are seen along the shore. We may still enter Rome, as he did, by the Appian, same Appian Road, through the space of Capenian Gate, and wander among the ruins of Caesar's palace on the Palatine, while our eye rests upon the same aqueducts radiating over Campania to the unchanging hills. Campania is the little bit of the region to the south of Rome, on the east. Those who have visited these spots must often have felt a thrill of recollection as they trod in the footsteps of the apostle. They must have been conscious of how much the identity of the outward scene brought them into communion with Paul, while they tried to imagine them to themselves the feelings with which he must have looked upon the objects before them. They who experience this will feel how imperfect a biography of St. Paul must be, whose faithful representations of the places which he visited. It is hoped that the views, he's got a footnote here, number one, the sentence of the text applies to the strictness only in quarto edition. Okay, it's an editorial remark about various editions and folios. It is hoped that the views which are contained in the present work, which have been di diligently collected from various sources, will supply this desideratum. But it is evident that for the purposes of such a biography, nothing but true and faithful representation of the real scenes will be valuable. These are what is wanted and not ideal representations, even though copied from the works of the great masters. For it has been well said, nature and reality, reality painted at the time, on the spot, a nobler cartoon of St. Paul's preaching at Athens than the immortal Raphael afterwards has done. It's a reference here to Wordsworth's Attic, Athens and Attica. Um, this would be a good place for us to stop. We're just refreshed here after having had the deal with Werner Kummel in our last segment. Although that was good comedy, this is good serious stuff. Pliny Barenhausen, the price of a book moment, P-O-B-M, the whole volume is worthwhile. I notice <clears throat> for those that if you want to do internet work, it's on archive.org. So you don't have to take a spot on the library show. Oh, we come to a famous hymn, words by Robert Robinson, 1735-1790. I thought this was a Wesley hymn. I got this right. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for sounds of songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount. Oh, fix me on it, mount of God's unchanging love. Here I find my greatest treasure. Hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it 
for thy courts above. And let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.